Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What an absolute pleasure it is to be back here at Rising Bharat. Thank you so much for being an incredible audience here, and we look forward to uh, to engaging with you on an issue that is. Uh, uh, occupying a lot of mind space and clearly generating a lot of headlines. I have a fabulous panel here with me this afternoon to talk about the trajectory that we are likely to see. It has been a record-breaking year for the Indian capital markets. To start with, we've seen the democratization of the Indian capital markets. The number of DMAT accounts in just the past one year up 34%. We've seen India emerge as one of the best performing markets in the world. We've seen record numbers in terms of mutual funds and asset under management, women are now participating in the Indian capital markets like never before. But to tell us what the road ahead looks like, what we can expect for India, for the Indian economy, and for the Indian markets, without further ado, I'm going to start the first round with 90 seconds each to my panelists here to give us their take on what they believe is the bull case for India. Ramesh Damani, veteran investor, you've of course uh, been bullish on the Indian markets for very, very long. And Ramesh, you know, I just want to, for the benefit of our audience here who are watching us online as well as here uh, at the Taj Palace in Delhi, remind you of that event in 2014 where your good friend, the late Rakesh Junjunwala said, if you're underinvested in India, you're going to miss out on the mother of all bull markets. Ramesh Damani, 90 seconds, your time starts now on the bull case for India. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shireen. Uh, you know, it's very interesting that uh, I just came back from the land of the rising sun. So I'm coming back to the rising Bharat right now. And the very instructive story to understand about what's happened in Japan. In 1964, when India last won the Olympic gold medal cleanly, without any, with a fair competition, was in Tokyo. The Nikkei was at 1,000. Over the next 25 years, it climbed from 1,000 to 40,000 in yen terms. Even dollar terms, it actually went to 100,000. Uh, so it had the mother of all bull runs in Japan. And I think Rakesh and me, we're kind of stock market uh, creatures. We believe that India is on a similar bull run. Like Japan went from a third world country to the second largest economy in the world. Companies that were unknown in Japan, 64, Sony, Hitachi, Honda, became household names. I think, and maybe, I, I hope I'm right, that India is on a similar trajectory. And what is powering this bull market in India? Every bull market has a thesis. What powers the bull market? I think what is powering this bull market is the growth of the great Indian middle class. I think finally we're having a great Indian middle class. People have a bit of extra money to save, extra money to invest. So you're seeing that coming through the DMAT accounts, coming seeing through in the domestic money inflows. So I think this is a long-term story. I don't think, uh, as my friend Rakesh would say, always be bullish on this country. And the volatility that we're seeing right now is more like a winter squall. It'll pass by, but people who stand still will end up making a lot of money. Well, speaking of making a lot of money, and since we are talking about Rakesh and his uh, predictions as well, Ramesh, you were in that room uh, when he said that uh, uh, the Nifty at 1 lakh by 2030, in fact, on an occasion he had said 1 lakh 25, but then he scaled it back. So 1 lakh by 2030? Th that seems a bit of a stretch, but the Sensex will get there. <laughs> the Sensex will get there. Ashish, let me come to you now. The bull case for India, 90 seconds. Now, we've just come out of the big report, uh, India's march onto the global stage. We are talking about, I think, the economy itself touching about $5 trillion by 2027, the market cap reaching about $10 trillion by 2030. I don't think uh, any other country can talk about so many things coming together. Uh, whether it's an under-leveraged economy, uh, CAPEX cycle, both government and uh, private sector, whether it's the demographic dividend that we are talking about, the rising middle class that uh, Ramesh just talked about. Uh, I think it's a lot more parallel to also what uh, the U.S. went through in the 80s, uh, you know, in terms of working population, savings habit. As you have more macro stability, lower inflation, the average uh, saver tends to invest more in equities. And I think that's the biggest delta. Uh, one statistic that I think cannot be underappreciated at all is even after all these years of DMAT accounts going up, equity savings being there, the equity household uh, savings is still about 5% of total savings, right? Gold is 16, so we have a long, long way to go. And we are not even counting when, as and when the FIs come back. So I think... Uh, can't get more bullish than this. When do you see the return of the FIIs? I think it started a bit last year with uh, a couple of large guys putting in sizable bets. 
uh, I think a lot more will follow. Uh, if, if I'm not wrong, I think so far the India investments have been driven by EM funds taking disproportionate bets on India. I think uh, the next five years will be about global funds stepping up uh, big ticket investments into Indian equity. Well, I, I, I'll get you to, to uh, uh, elaborate more on that in just a second. But Shweta, let me talk to you about what we are seeing as far as the private equity mood is concerned. And the mood has been buoyant over the last few years, including for Advent specifically. Uh, you know, you're looking to utilize another 5 to $10 billion of your capital in India over the next few years. Your bull case for India. So I believe India is not a story of one year or two years. I think it's a multi-decade uh, growth story from here on, right? I think we have, it'll be a pity if we don't capitalize on it because we literally have, you know, when we, all flags are green at this point in time. So if you look at some things that both Ramesh and Ashish spoke about, right, our demographic profile, right, we have the largest probably working population of 900 million across any geography across the globe, right? And that just lends itself to a large consumption story for India. So that is, I would say, one big positive. Government capex cycle, I think, is going to be, propel the economy a lot in terms of growth. And lastly, the one thing that we didn't talk about so far was just the whole policy framework in India, mm -hmm. right? And that has been so supportive, starting with re reducing the corporate tax rate a few years back, or you know, the bankruptcy law, GST. All of these is just uh, providing the inherent infrastructure underlying infrastructure for corporate India to really outperform uh, the growth we are seeing anywhere else in the world, right? So for us and private equity, as you can see, everybody is really bullish on India, like Advent and like my global folks said, about 5 to $10 million a month back. I think last year, the private equity investment in India was $40 billion. Yeah. It did peak in 21 at $70 billion, And I do see that peak coming back sooner than later, just given the whole buoyancy around India that we are seeing anywhere I go in, in the globe and meet our investors, meet our uh, general partners. Everybody's just talking about India rising. What's and India the shining. number one question that they ask you? How much can you invest in India? <laughs> <laughs> How much can we invest yeah, in India and yes. where, do we, where do we put that money to work? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll get you to respond to where you uh, tell them that money should go to, uh, to work. But Harsha, first of all, congratulations. Uh, Harsha is an investor in India's newest airline. They took their first flight yesterday. So ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. And Ramesh Zamani, also an investor. Uh, he's the he, captain. <laughs> he, he's the captain. But Harsha, you know what they say. And I'm not going to go down that cliche of how do you get a billionaire to lose his uh, billions, but that's really been the story as far as Indian aviation is concerned. You're being brave-hearted, aren't you? Thank you, Shireen. I wish I got a penny for every time I heard that comment. <laughs> which, is why I didn't, which is why I didn't make it. Which is why I didn't make it. <laughs> yeah. But um, on that specific point, I will say that um, it's clear that India's problems needs, needs Indian solutions. And we believe with the airline that that's what we're addressing. And in many other investments that me and my contemporaries are making, I think we're solving India's problems with Indian solutions. To answer your question about the bull case, I, would, um, I was reflecting on this a little while ago. And in the old days, the gap between our bull case and our bear case used to be a wide range in India. Today, we seem to be in a somewhat privileged position where the, the gap has narrowed significantly. And I'd say with some level of reliability and certainty, we know where we as a nation are going. I think uh, Jeffries and many of the, of the other analysts have um, published a lot of research on this sub topic. You know, we should be the, the third largest economy by 2027. Our stock market has done well. It looks like it will continue to do well. Um, and so I'd say the, the bull case um, is not altogether that different from the realistic case or even the bear case in that India is looking to be good. Now, on a slightly related point, what do all of us want as citizens and residents? We want safety for us, our, ourselves and our families. We want political stability, and we want um, that political stability to be accompanied by direction from the government in terms of where we as citizens can, can, get, can get to and businesses can get to. And the third thing is we want economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. In the old days, those three things used to be available elsewhere. We, had, we used to look around the world and say, that's in a first world country, not our country. Today, the India that we're living in today has those three things. And as we look around the world, we kind of look back home and say, 
like all of us in this room, things are better over here. So I'd say that that's the realistic case. That is the realistic case, and that's the big change that is driving the investment psyche and the investment uh, cycle as well. But Ramesh, you know, to the changes that uh, Shweta also brought up, and all of you have alluded to, the structural changes that have happened, one of the calls that you made uh, a few uh, years ago, in fact, was as far as the PSU stocks were concerned, and what a rally we've seen as far as the PSU stocks. In fact, I don't think we would have ever imagined that we would have seen the Prime Minister address the rally that we've seen in PSU stocks in Parliament. Ramesh Tamani, from here on, you know, given where valuations are, given the structural reform story, given economic stability, policy stability, so on and so forth, is that a bet that you continue to make? Yeah, I, I feel cheated like I'm on the bazaar show in the morning at 9 <laughs> o'clock. That's what they typically would ask me. But uh, to answer your question, uh, every bull market has leadership. So the 2000 bull market, for example, was led by the technology stocks in India which saw the huge technology revolution take place in India. I think what this bull market is partially being led by the PSU stocks, and they're saying that the level of corporate governance has improved in these stocks, that we no longer have the leakage, we no longer have the phone banking that India was so famous for in the prior bull market. So this sector, this PSU sector, will continue to lead this bull market higher. Now people are, sometimes say there's a bubble going on or there's yeah. a fraud going on, and they will correct, as all good bull markets have corrections in a period of time. But I think the eventuality of these prices will be significantly higher than they are even today. And the reason for it is twofold. One, of course, the PSUs are the leading edge of the capex spend. The government is using infrastructure spend, defense spend, railway spend as a leading edge for capex. And plus, the corporate governance has improved. And you're coming, you're swinging the pendulum from ridiculously cheap to now probably overvalued at some point in time. But right now, they're, they're good buys, even across the PSU sector. You know, you talked about uh, bubbles, uh, Ramesh, and, and uh, you know, there is a debate at this point in time whether in some parts of the market, some pockets of the market, uh, we are now entering bubble territory. What's your take, especially as far as the small and mid-cap space is concerned? You know, there's always froth in the market, and that corrects itself. Market is correcting. For example, there's some froth in the best private sector bank in India. It hasn't performed for three years. So the froth gets taken care of the market. I don't believe we're in bubble territory. Uh, people from Jamie Dimon to Jim Rogers have been calling for a bubble in American markets for the last five years, and the market keeps surprising them. NVIDIA becomes such a powerful company. I don't believe that's uh, bubblish. There is froth. Market is taking care of that. And, you know, it's... Uh, what the wise words were said to us when we first entered the market, caveat emptor, buyer beware. We need, if you're going to put our money, we're going to put our wallet on the stocks, we should be careful about what we are buying. That is our job. You know, uh, speaking of valuations, Ashish, and let's address what we are seeing emerge as the big trend. <coughs> a lot of the MNCs are actually hiving stake or pairing stake as far as their Indian subsidiaries are concerned to make use of this valuation arbitrage at this point in time. D you know, we've seen it happen with Whirlpool. We've seen it happen more recently with BAT, uh, you know, as far as its uh, stake sale in ITC is concerned. We're seeing Tata Sons do it in TCS, uh, that announcement coming in just yesterday. Do you see this trend continuing? And more importantly, from a government perspective, even if government companies were to divest to just be able to get to public float, uh, the fundraising opportunities that it presents? Well, I think, uh, you know, definitely India would need a lot of growth capital. What we have seen so far last year, bulk of the fundraise was sell downs, whether by MNCs, by promoters, and by private equity. I think uh, if you look at the fresh issuance coming out of India, it's still way below what the uh, global benchmarks are. So we are still talking about 1% of market cap every year. Uh, that number peaked in China at about 4 to 5%. So there is still a long, long way to go. I think India can take a lot more issuance, and which in my view is the best thing that can happen because the most common pushback that global investors have historically had on India is the liquidity itself. I think one of the reasons we saw a few large investors coming in hold was also because of the liquidity events that the country is now able to produce. So in a way, uh, fresh issuance crossing 100 billion will bring in own set of investors. I think some of the MNCs selling down, uh, some of the promoters selling down is uh, use of capital for other growth businesses. Yeah. I think India has also come of age where a lot of corporations are now talking about spending in R&D, whether it is uh, green hydrogen or energy in general. 
And I think that's one of the longest standing complaints again in India that Indian companies have not invested in R&D. Yeah. So maybe this is that capital which will go there. And I don't think sell down is ever a benchmark of uh, it's an expensive stock because uh, for the largest, uh, Ramesh spoke about private sector banks, they were always owned by foreigners and yeah. sold down by the Indian government, but they gave fabulous returns. So I don't think that's the best uh, cue whether they are expensive or not. You know, Harsh, I want to pick up on the consumption theme that uh, Ramesh, Ashish, and Shweta uh, spoke about as well. And yes, we are seeing the consumption boom take shape and propel growth, but in some pockets of the economy. I don't know if you looked at the latest numbers that Indus Valley, uh, the consumption report had put together, but it's essentially the 30 million households that are really doing the buying, so to speak, and the aspirational India is the middle chunk which hopefully will start to move from the 2,500 per capita to 5,000 per capita and then continue to drive consumption. What's the big consumption bet uh, that you're playing on at this point in time? And, and where do you believe we are going to see value being unlocked? Shireen, the consumption, I'd say, is uh, one of the, the... Domestic consumption is one of the strengths of our nation today. We used to live in a paradigm where India had four metros. Somewhere along the way, we said maybe it's five now. Today, I'd argue that all the top 20 or 30 cities in India are all absolute metros. They all have metro systems. They all have international airports. They all have good infrastructure that's improved dramatically. And therefore, the residents of those uh, cities have seen economic prosperity, uh, rising affluence levels, which results in consumption. And so we have, as you pointed out, at least 30 million households, which would be about 120 million people, some may argue it's even more than that. We have uh, people who are qualified to be working and contributing at, in, any, in any place in the world, and indeed they are. For example, you know, 20% of JP Morgan's workforce is in India, and not all of them are in just one city or one metro. Mm. So with that, we have consumption that is absolutely world-class because Indians now know what the world has to offer, don't even have to go very far to get it. They can get... Um, FMCG items, they can get automobiles, they can get uh, luxury products, uh, even basic products anywhere in the country. So I'd say that consumption has gone deep. Consumption is going to deepen from here on. But Shweta, you know, let's talk about consumption, but also link it uh, to the broader formalization as far as the economy is concerned, as well as the empowerment of the bottom of the pyramid. You've just done a big deal, not big from an advent uh, uh, war chest point of view, but big for the uh, entrepreneur that you've decided to back, Ananya Birla's microfinance venture. Uh, explain to me what you're seeing happen as far as the bottom of the pyramid is concerned and what your thesis is on that moving towards the aspirational class and the value it will potentially unlock. Yeah. I mean, that is really the bottom of the pyramid, right? I mean, it is not the middle class. It is no. not the, uh, you know, increasing household income class, mm -hmm. right? This is really the rural economy which it supports it's at some level, right? It is the joint liability groups, these women in villages getting together and raising some finance to be able to do small businesses, right? And I think that grassroots level financing, erstwhile was done by money lenders at some, you know, insane rates, right? And that's what is getting substituted by these microfinance companies. And we just know how big rural India is and how they are largely reliant on agriculture today. And that is what, you know, we are trying to change. Can they have other sources of income? Can they find other sources of livelihood in the rural uh, part of India? And can they get good financing to build those businesses? Mm -hmm. And that's what Ananya Birla's company Swatantra does. And that's what we have, you know, that is the hypothesis that we have backed, that it's a huge white space. I mean, it's, we barely even touched the tip, uh, tip of the iceberg at this point in time. There's mm. so much to go and so much depth in that market. And we want to build off that. You know, speaking of white spaces, Ramesh, and I want to come to you with that. Uh, Outside of what we've already spoken of, which are the white spaces that excite you, where you believe we will start to see private capital moving in? And in terms now, we're uh, you know, on the cusp of, of the general elections. In terms of the big ticket items on the unfinished reform agenda, what would you like the next government to prioritize? Well, I think the Prime Minister said that better than I could ever say that in uh, the few conclave a few days ago when he said infrastructure, railway, defense, exports. All that's going to happen, I think, in the next generation of reforms. Because the broad tax card, GST, IBC, as well, this has all been done. So now we want to promote uh, consumption investment. Semiconductors, I'm not sure about that, but semiconductors also. But if you ask me for a white space, uh, Shireen, uh, 
Harsha was talking about, uh, you know, we've already witnessed a tech revolution in India. I think we're not understanding but a BPO revolution is coming to India, the kind of which will just surprise us because real estate costs are so cheap in India, you're communicating at zero cost now with the rest of the world. So a lot of the back office work, in America you have 3% unemployment rate, 3% unemployment rate, you can't find people at $20 an hour out there. You can shift all that work in India because communication and land costs are very cheap. So I think India will become, we already had tech superpower, will become a back office superpower. I think we'll but aren't we already the back office superpower? You know, we've done nothing, we're just going to start, we're just barely getting started. I think we have focused more on tech, and I think not on high tech, but on tech, basic tech services economy. But I think the superpower in terms of back office will just explode, it's exploding before our eyes. Because the first time now, land costs are zero. Even in an AI world? Yeah, I think so because a lot of this mortgage processing, all this basic stuff would still require some human intervention. So in AI world, well, yes, that is a black box that I'm not familiar with yet. But I think given the other things that are taking place in India, a stable regulatory environment, low land costs, good communication ability, satellite communication available, I think that would be a big boom industry. White spaces, the big themes, Ashish, that you believe are going to drive growth in the coming decade? I think real estate would be the, my number one choice. Uh, I think uh, for the last decade or decade and a half, real estate or housing in general has been a beneficiary of the economic activity. I think the sides will turn. Housing will be the driver of economic activity over the next decade. So the entire value chain, right, right from <coughs> a developer to building materials to financiers, I think that's, that's going to be one of the largest contributors to the GDP. Uh, the other theme on the same lines we like is hard assets, so infrastructure. Uh, hotels, airports, ports, uh, hospitals. I think in, in an inflationary world where cost of capital is going to play a major role, mm. uh, consolidation is going to be the theme. And that's why as a house we've been big believers in owning hard assets. And you think private equity is going to play consolidator? Shweta, are you going to, are you going to do the consolidating? Already doing a lot of it, <laughs> right? I mean, we have a whole uh, pharma platform where we've integrated a CDMO and API business. But on white spaces, I would say all businesses that play on the China plus one theme, right? Manufacturing. I mean, that is something that's been underinvested on for, you know, a decade plus. I think that's going to be a big white space, in my opinion. I, I, was, I was expecting you to, half expecting you, Ramesh, to talk about manufacturing, but you didn't bring that up. You don't believe that that's going to be the big opportunity as well? No, it, P, I'm, I'm not particularly a fan of PLI investment. I don't think the government should be directing uh, capital to areas. I mean, Japan tried that and it fell flat on their faces. So I'm not particularly, I'm more into the services consumption part of the Indian economy. So maybe Harsha has some view on Harsha, are you somewhere in, in between? I, 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 yes, I am in between. I'd say that, um, I'd argue that the, we're the only country uh, in the world that has gone through a simultaneous industrial revolution and digital revolution. That has allowed us to leapfrog. And we're seeing this with our infrastructure, physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, all manufacturing and all logistics has become seamless in India, maybe in the last 10 years only. Now, what that means is that it's all white space. There's huge opportunity. We're not growing and moving incrementally. We're moving absolute leapfrogging. And therefore, I do believe that some of the initiatives the government has taken, GST yeah. was huge and has absolutely transformed this nation. Udan scheme in regional aviation was introduced eight years ago, and somehow, despite government intervention to help private airlines uh, uh, go, to, go into the hinterland, private airlines were a little slow to do it. PLI, in the same way, I'd argue, adoption has been slow, but when adoption takes off, we're going to see India become a lithium-ion battery manufacturing hub for the world. Mm. And maybe aircraft, aerospace in the future, we're already sending um, spaceship to the, to the moon. We should be doing a lot more of that. Other initiatives that the government has in place, such as Gift City, I think can yep. absolutely uh, transform not just our financial markets, but perhaps global financial markets. You know, the role of uh, global factors as well, and Ramesh, let me uh, address that issue with you. I think what we hear from each one of you on this panel is that uh, the domestic risks are limited at this point in time. In fact, none of you brought up a single risk, uh, domestic risk at this point. So the risks are external. Uh, the expectation of a, of a Fed cut coming in in June, at least at this point in time, look less likely. What would be the external factors, the risk factors, Ramesh, that you would watch out for that could potentially impact us? I mean, uh, Shri, the world is a dangerous place. We are fighting two wars as we speak. 
uh, while bull markets don't stop because of wars, that might surprise a lot of people. I think bull markets uh, fall of their own weight. I mean, Japan continued to grow, but at some point it just peaked out and didn't come back for 40 years or so. So excess uh, weight, leverage, uh, you know, there's nothing that the government, China's markets are trading 10, 12 years low. The Chinese economy has done reasonably well over a period of time. So markets, when uh, the bad news, of course, Shirin, is that all bull markets end. Even this bull market will end, I guarantee you that. There has never been a bull market in the history of the world that continues on ad infinitum. So this will end too, which is fine. We'll hopefully be able to tell you on Bazaar when it's ending. <laughs> but for right now, it seems like a green signal ahead. And bull markets will end up its own orgy, its own uh, speculative excesses. I don't see we are anywhere near that at this point. I feel the markets are in decently good shape. Uh and, you know, to, to address the issue about uh, global funds investing more in India, we've again seen some triggers uh, with the JP Morgan bond index inclusion, uh, possibly another index inclusion as well. Uh, you know, where typically do you see the flows coming in? Will U.S. drive a large part of the fund flows into India? I think it will be uh, global. I think a lot of pension funds would start looking at India. Uh, as, uh, as a place where they can deploy a lot of liquidity uh, in good companies with the best macro that one can hope for. And I think the, the amount of investment that the government has done over the last few years to improve uh, you know, foreign policy relations with a number of countries, I think we will see a lot more new markets investing in India. U.S., of course, likely to be at the forefront. They have the largest AUM. Most global large asset managers are headquartered out of there. So that will continue to be the single largest. So what's uh, the incremental flow that you anticipate over the next few years? Well, I think uh, last year's flow of $20 billion was honestly not even remotely close to what it can be. So we've been talking a lot about the domestic flows, and they have become very sizable in India. Uh, and I think they will continue to grow. But at the same time, I won't be surprised if the FII inflow into the country can go up 5 to 10x from where currently it is over the next few years. And uh, I can tell you, I think most EM funds are overweight India. Yeah. Most global funds, don't. many of them don't even own a single stock. So the kind of liquidity events we are seeing now is the perfect backdrop for them to come back into India in size. Okay. Uh, a significant increase in fund flow driven by uh, U.S.-based funds is what you're expecting global funds to invest. But Shweta, you know, let's address the issue that we were talking about, private equity uh, playing consolidator. And we've seen a lot of buyout deals take place. We've seen a lot of private equity players take management control. Healthcare is a classic example of what we've seen happen with private equity coming in and taking control. Which are the other spaces that look exciting at this point in time from a private equity perspective? You know, I hate to pick a sector typically because it's, you know, today something is a flavor, today financial services flavor of the season, tomorrow healthcare is, day after industrials is, right? So I think the approach that private equity by and large adopts, including ourselves, is really bottom up, right? So we like, I, I would say, by and large all themes in India, right? Whether it is consumption, healthcare, financial services, all kind of playing the underlying fundamental growth of India, right? Then it is really about the company where there is, you know, where we look at the micro aspects of a company as opposed to just a top top down piece. But I feel all sectors are interesting today. I mean, uh, I spoke about manufacturing, which is a new theme which private equity hasn't done enough of, which is something that we are picking up in a big way. Uh, there's healthcare, there's financial services, still a very credit underpenetrated uh, economy, right? So there's a lot you can do on the financial services across spectrum, microfinance to bank, we've done it all. Uh, and, you know, I would say healthcare, uh, again, you know, significant underpenetration both on pharma and services side. So I would say across the board, I think they're excited about it. Let me link this back to the bull yeah. case that you spoke of. You know, the, the expectation or the assumption was that private equity would really have to be patient capital uh, when they put their money to work in India. Is that starting to change both in terms of exit opportunities as well as in terms of returns? Most certainly, yes. So I think the exit environment is far more vibrant than it was even five years back, let alone a decade back, right? But having said that, I would still say it's a, you know, you need to be patient in India. Uh, because it's, you know, while the bull case, you, and you asked this question earlier, what is the risk? The risk is an execution risk here, right? So while everything will eventually go up, I think there will be bumps along the way, like in any other emerging which is, which, market, which right? Is par, which is par, par for cost. But, yeah. but you know, let's talk 
about the exit opportunities. Let's talk about what we've seen happen as far as the IPO pipeline is concerned. Uh, you know, what gives you confidence on that side of the story and how do you see that playing itself out over the next few years? I, I, I don't know much about the IPO market, to be honest. I rarely subscribe to IPOs uh, myself. Secondary markets were offering great bargains, but i just add to the point that Harsha said, India's, you know, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon 50 years ago, he said, it's a small leap for man, but a great leap for mankind. He was talking about the great step he made on the moon. I think digitization is a great leap uh, forward. We're not understanding the full impact of what digitization meant. While I was coming in the plane, uh, Shireen, I read this quote which said that, in the near future, every product will be manufactured digitally and then physically. So that's a huge change that's taking place, whether in our BPO businesses, whether it's in our manufacturing businesses, whether it's in our country, in terms of delivering services to the corporate citizens. And India is amazingly, even as I speak to you, a leader in digital services, UPI, Aadhaar, Paytm, whatever. It's extraordinary what strides we made in the last five years of digitization. So I think there's one theme you want to latch on to this thing, it's digitization. Digitization, the big theme as far as Ramesh Tamani is concerned. Harsha, uh, you know, for the decade, since we are taking a more long-term view here as far as this panel is concerned, uh, you know, one headline that you would chase? I would headline, I would chase the Indian consumer who is a force to reckon with, both within India. We actually see that by virtue of the stock market and the retail participation there. We see that by virtue of the domestic consumption story. But the Indian consumer will be a global force. And we're seeing that with international travel and tourism, where the Indian consumer is already a global force. And we'll see it in many other categories as well. I'd say that uh, it's a great time to be an Indian. It's a great time to be in India, and it's a great time to be an Indian as well. Ashish, you know, I, I, I don't remember the last time I heard global CEO of the luxury brands like Bulgari talking about the fact that India is going to be one of their top five markets over the next decade. So that story is clearly booming. I mean, you can't get enough Mercedes off the shelves. You can't get enough watches and bags and so on and so forth off the shelves. How much of that is going to be thematically a, a, a theme that you see continuing to play out? I would still be, uh, so I agree with Rasha uh, on the, you have to follow Indian consumer and that will be a global force. But I think the Indian consumer is also value conscious, so he's going to invest a lot more, is the hope and uh, the right thing to do, rather than just consume foreign Our luxury banks. Are going to find it harder now to get deposits, given the fact that we're seeing a lot of that money coming into the markets? Well, definitely, yes. <laughs> that that's, that's, is the case, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, private banks, after outperforming for two decades, started underperforming, because it's no longer the first choice of savings for a lot of consumers. And uh, I think that will be the trend going forward. The headline that you're going to chase, Shweta, over the next decade. Uh, so, I mean, it is actually across the board, right? I mean, for us, it is India is the investment destination across the globe, right? Uh, pick any country, and I would say that uh, it, it has some chinks in the armor today, which is which are challenges. As it stands today, don't see don't see too many of those in India. So, I would say. Uh, you know, double Just down on India. India. Just chase double, India. Double down on India. <laughs> double, <laughs> down, double, on, double, double down, down on India. On India. <laughs> yeah. But Ramesh, you know, on the unfinished agenda, will it matter, for instance, if the next government were to do bank privatization or not? Asset monetization, big pipeline had been laid out. We didn't deliver on that front. I mean, I'm asking from a market's perspective, what will the market factor in in terms of expectations or asks from the next government? I mean, there is some expectation that the government will privatize a lot of its assets. The government has publicly said that. They will do that. But I think more important, we want good corporate governance. We want less corruption, less leakages, which I think this government has already delivered. If they do uh, extraordinarily good privatization, like IDBA Bank is up on the block, if that is done in a fair, transparent manner, I think the market will be extremely enthused by that. And I think that depends on the majority that this government gets uh, finally, if they get a good majority. I think they'll be able to put some uh, thoughts through parliament, which other governments could not do because of, say, paucity of numbers. Like what? What would the number one priority for on that front be? What you would like them to do? No, a PSU privatization theme. PSU I'm saying if they actually take that to the next level, the government has said that other than strategic defense and space, they will privatize all the PSUs. Yeah. It makes sense to me. But more importantly is the first step they've taken 
is to improve the corporate governance. I mean, the corporate governance improved dramatically in those PSUs. So th that has enthused the market first off. That will actually be the icing on the cake. Uh, Ashish, uh, you know, to, uh, to you as well, on the unfinished agenda, what is it that you would like to see being prioritized as far as policy intervention, government decision making is concerned? I think for the next decade or so, some incentive to do big ticket R&D. Uh, whether it is setting up large uh, reputable educational institutions, uh, encouraging more and more R&D. And I think India can afford to do that today. Uh, the way uh, we have seen a conglomeration of the country, uh, top five groups have a lot of cash flow at their disposal. And I think that can be put to good use with the right kind of government reform. So that's one thing that I would put on the top uh, on unfinished agenda. Okay, so drive the R&D push. Uh, but the government has sort of, you know, said that, look, it's up to the corporate sector to, to do that. But on the larger issue of private sector capex really taking off, not picking up, taking off, do you expect that to happen over the next few years? I think definitely, yes. And uh, I think one, one segment that we didn't speak much about was the energy space. I think the largest uh, capex will be in that space. And I think India On the has, renewable side. On the renewable side. And I, thermal will also make a comeback given the, the, the sheer demand for power that we will have as a nation. Uh, on the renewable side, again, I'll say green hydrogen or uh, green energy in general would require a lot of capex R&D as well. So I think that's one theme that can be the largest uh, Indian company a decade from now could be in the energy space. Would be in the energy space? Could be from the energy space. Could be for potentially from the energy space. Harsha Raghavan, you've already got two aircraft. What could your fleet look like given the fact that you're so bullish on the Indian consumer? Well, India has, um, you know, a couple of hundred airports. And um, many of them are all very well maintained by the Airports Authority of India and other um, administrators, but unfortunately underserved or even totally unserved. And um, there are large population centers who either wish to travel or live in those locations and who need a solution. So um, we believe that the opportunity to uh, provide air travel, cheap, efficient, and comfortable air travel across every part of India, we believe it's a huge opportunity. And we believe that that's what the Indian consumer needs. And, and what kind of money are we talking about that you're not, not just in the aviation side of the business, but outside of that, that you are going to put to work over the next five to ten years? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the white spaces are tremendous and across the board as India leapfrogs across the industrial revolution and digital revolution. So I'd say that the, the industry will put many billions to work. We'll play our small little role in that with our, uh, with our small fund at Convergent Finance. Well, Ramesh Damani, I'm going to ask you to wrap this up because I know that, uh, uh, that you always have something very wise to share with us. Uh, you know, as we look at India's place in the world, as we look at what's happening in the rest of the world, but more importantly, what's propelling the Indian economy, all the factors that you spoke of, many have called it India's decade, many believe it could be potentially India's century as well. How would you sum up the India story today? You know, Shirin, I'm often asked this question, I say, when is the best time to invest in India? Is it too late now? Is it one, the best time to invest in India was in July 1992, just before liberalization was announced. The second best time to invest in India is today. I think the country is on an upward trajectory out there. I think we're on a path that will take us from a third world country to the second largest economy in the world. And I think the best way is, as Indians have now figured out in the last few years, is participate. Put your money to work in the stock market because it gives you better returns than your FD and your bank deposits. So I think it's a great time to invest in India, and I think in the next 20 years, we'll see a transformation in our lives that we could not have imagined that would have taken place 20 years back. But so I, with the rest of the panel, remain the eternal optimist. The glass is always full out here. Well, it is the time to bet on India, and it is the time to invest in India. That is unequivocally the message here from our panel of experts. Thank you so much, Ashish Shweta, Ramesh Damani, and Harsha. Thank you very, very much for your insights and for sharing your wonderful stories here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for joining us here this afternoon. <laughs>